All right, it's good to see you all. I'm happy to see people piling in. Welcome to our webinar. I'll give more time for folks to flow in. Uh, in the meantime, I'll just go over the typical housekeeping stuff. So uh, for folks you, who are in already, you might have noticed that you are muted and off camera. That'll be uh, the norm for the entirety of the webinar. Um, if you have a colleague that wanted to attend and is going to miss, or if you feel like you missed any information throughout the webinar, rest assured it is going to be recorded. So you will be able to access that recording uh, once the webinar ends today. Um, you might notice that it might be on the right hand side of your screen that there's a chat box. Feel free to use that, send along any questions or comments that you might have throughout the webinar. And for those who are in attendance right now, go ahead and introduce yourselves and the organization that you're with. Test out the chat box. Uh, you might notice that there's also a chat and a questions box. The, you can use the little questions box for your questions and then whatever uh, comments you might have throughout the webinar, just use the chat box for that. Um, We'll have a window of time at the end of our discussion to host a Q&A. It'll be about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the amount of questions that we have. Uh, recording and, like I said, the recording of both the presentations and a copy of the slides will be sent out in a following email, as well as any other helpful resources like web pages, documents, and other things that are shared throughout the discussions. And again, that'll be sent out later this week. You can access the recording on our YouTube channel at the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, or our website at nchv.org. You'll find that three out of the four episodes of the series are uploaded there. They're fantastic webinars on staffing challenges, fundraising, strategy, fundraising strategies, and data and compliance. So for those of you who are new and unfamiliar with the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, or NCHV for short, our goal is to put an end to veteran homelessness. We work toward that goal by sharing best practices, working in the policy space, as well as connecting service providers and people at risk or experiencing homelessness with helpful resources. And these webinars are made possible through the generosity of the Home Viva Foundation, which enabled us to start this project back in 2021. And we've had some very excellent webinars covering a variety of topics since then. So fast forward now, we're in 2023, and we are at the final webinar of this weekly series, which is focused on optimizing internal operations to better serve vets. We go over the operational challenges that service providers might face and the solutions to overcome them. A reoccurring theme of the last three webinars is that to provide clients with quality services, organizations must be equipped with the resources to carry out that very important work. And there's no doubt that capacity and the availability of said resources are inherently tied together. With that said, tackling veteran homelessness is a highly complex issue. And there isn't a one size fits all organization to do all the work or a silver bullet program that wraps up every case. This calls for organizations to work together and form strategic partnerships covering services where they might otherwise lack. So the big picture goal in mind is, of course, solving veteran homelessness. Therefore, it's crucial for organizations to share resources, information and services that can help close gaps in capacity. There's been excellent work done by our service provider to lower the count of homeless veterans throughout the country and significant work um, has been done. Uh, but there are still thousands of those in need. So we do need to identify and employ partnerships that empower providers to meet the unmet needs of those veterans. So moving on, we have an excellent panel who will delve into what strategic partnerships are, where they fit within an organization and the ultimate outcomes. So we'll start off with Deandra Gorlay, a VP or Vice President of Social Services at Volunteers of America or VOA in Michigan. We'll talk about road mapping strategic partnerships and forming that network. And then we'll close off with Kurt Shaky, or Shaky, sorry, Executive Director of the Veterans Transition Center. He'll highlight VTC's work around key partnerships that help close service gaps. Uh, we'll have each panelist introduce themselves during their presentation. Uh, I'm going to go off mute and off camera and I uh, want to remind everyone to use that chat box to put forward your comments and questions and we'll address those in the Q&A session. And don't forget to introduce yourself and your organization. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Deandra, you have the floor. All right. Thank you so much, Jay. I am happy to be here today. So as stated, my name is Deandra Gorlay. I'm the Vice President of Social Services at Volunteers of America, Michigan. 
I'm also the co-chair of the Detroit Veterans Leadership Committee, which is the subcommittee of the COC tasked with solving veteran homelessness for the city of Detroit, Hamtramck, and Highland Park. And then I'm also a chair in the American Society for Public Administration um, in Metro Detroit. So we can go to the next slide. <laughs> so a few of the topics we'll cover is, you know, who we are at VOAMI and what we do, and then how I bring in strategic partnerships and what I think about when I'm looking for strategic partnerships. And then I'll share some of the examples from the work I have done in my years at VOA. So we'll go to the next slide. Volunteers of America Michigan um, is the state's largest private provider of services to veterans. So those familiar with Michigan, um, we cover the bottom third of the state. So think Detroit, um, Grand Rapids, Battle Creek, Lansing, those are our major metro areas. Um, and it's about 18 counties. So Volunteers of America National has been around for just over 127 years, and it has a long history of serving veterans across the United States. In VOA Michigan, our primary focus over the last few decades has been to serve veterans through housing, healthcare, and employment services. So I joined VOA in 2019, and I have worked in our veteran services area for three years now. And during that time, our programs have more than doubled as far as what we offer and the funding streams we have to serve our veterans here in Detroit and the other metro areas. And we've become one of the leaders here in the city of Detroit working to hit functional zero in veteran homelessness. Um, we've expanded the ways that we serve homeless and unstably housed veterans in all of the counties that we serve. Um, and most recently, we have expanded to provide mental health and suicide prevention to our veterans who need that as well. So our key areas of focus in those 18 counties are housing, mental health and suicide prevention, food insecurity, employment, and other basic needs. So we'll go to the next slide. So when I think about what the benefits are of bringing in strategic partnerships, I first want to acknowledge that I primarily serve urban and suburban areas. So if you're in a rural area, some of what I talk about may not be totally applicable, um, but we do have counties that touch on rural areas, but we have those urban centers that are nearby. Um, so I hope I'm still able to provide some practical advice for those in rural areas, but I am speaking from an urban experience. What I first want to say is that since 2017, Detroit has reduced veteran homelessness by 17%. So when I talk about what the benefits are, that's really where I'm speaking from, is that you can make these huge milestones and growth towards hitting functional zero in veteran homelessness. The majority of that work or the secret sauce to the work here in Detroit is really a partnership. Um, we have many providers at the table, some of us with duplicative services, but we work together and so whenever you know myself or other folks working in this space you know are in interviews and they ask well what is detroit what is detroit doing what is detroit doing we say again we're just working together like there that's really the magic behind it um, and how we're making these huge reductions so the benefits are that you are more effective together. I think a lot of times in a nonprofit mindset, we're thinking about our metrics we have to hit, the funding we have to spend, and the results we have to deliver. And there can be some hesitancy to form partnerships because it might reduce or reduce like what we are able to do from our grant. And I have to say, in my experience, that has not been true. We've actually had more veterans come into our programs. Um, more outcomes delivered because we have these partnerships. So going from that scarcity mindset to what is possible really is, you know, the first step in forming strategic partnerships. Um, I want you to think not be hesitant to reach out to folks, but really like what could you bring to the table? Um, and in Detroit, you know, we have three SSVF providers all working in one area. So there are duplicative services, but because the three of us work together, um, I've only seen benefits to that. So first, homelessness and solving homelessness is a system response. So as Jay said, there is no one single provider or person that is able to do this. 
when you have a system focus on solving homelessness, it's just going to be more effective at reducing the number of veterans who hit the system, reducing the length of stay that they're in homelessness, and increasing the likelihood that they're going to stay in housing. Um, so by building those partnerships or a coalition or a continuum of care, you're only strengthening the system and hopefully it means less folks hitting the system and they're in it less time. The second thing is it helps fill the gaps. So every veteran, as you know, has unique need beyond just housing to ensure that they're stabilized. So the more folks that are committed to the work, the more resources and connections you have for those veterans um, and for your agency and for those needs. The third, you know, similar to filling the gaps is there's no one size fits all approach. So the more resources you have, the more pathways you can offer your veteran um, and the likelihood that they're going to have a, um, an improved outcome. And then the outcomes. Ultimately, by having more partners and more people at the table, we've had the outcomes that we have in Detroit, you know, that 70% reduction is really because of the partnership that we have. So ultimately, to my last point, it's going to improve the outcome for your vet and it's going to improve your system the more people you can bring to the table. And the more people you bring to the table, I notice more people want to join. Um, it's like a party. They see everyone is working hard, so they want to join in it too. We'll go to the next slide. So I will tell you about the work we're doing in Detroit um, and how we've made these significant reductions in veteran homelessness and you know who is at the table and also who isn't at the table and what we've done to either work around it or try and get to a better spot. Um, so Detroit started focusing on veteran homelessness with community solutions um, in the Built for Zero program in 2017. And it really started with the VA Medical Center and the community providers who had SSVF and grant and per diem program. Here at VOA, we have both an SSVF and a grant and per diem. So we were originally part of that group. And then later we added our community shelter providers and much later our city of Detroit staff and our county and state. We all meet quite regularly. So those meetings look like our leadership meeting where we set our priorities, we vote on objectives, we agree and we disagree. And we have the improvement team where we work through some of our hiccups, our challenges and our program um, opportunities. In both of those meetings, um, we have representatives from everyone listed here. So those folks are at different levels in their organization. At the improvement team, we have folks who are more connected to the clients, who are working day in and day out, who see what the challenges are, where we aren't meeting our veterans. And at the leadership level, we have the leadership from the organization as well. So those are open for anyone to attend as well. They're public meetings, they're part of the COC, um, but really it's where we can dive into the work and have very candid and honest conversations and if a partner believes that something isn't going to work, we have a space and a platform um, where they can talk about it and where we can be honest and candid and work to find a better solution. Some later uh, partners that we've brought to the table are our landlords. So they see what we're doing in Detroit and believe it or not, the more media we get about reducing veteran homelessness in Detroit, it's like the more landlords that call us that wanna help to be part of the solution. Um, and, you know, the other partners who were not at the table were our county vet navigators. Um, they are now at the table. We still don't have our housing authority, which um, is really challenging, but we found a workaround for it. And we don't have elected officials who aren't at the table. So, you know, I'm not going to paint the picture that we're perfect and we have everyone we need. Um, but we're still working to bring other partners to the table in this work because we know the more people who are there and committed and involved, the better it's going to be. When it comes to our housing authority, because they're not there, and so our bash voucher landlords um, can witness delays in getting apartments certified, we've been using our SSVF grant to bridge those veterans over. So within the partnerships that we do have, we were able to figure out a workaround um, and do what we could with the resources that we had. All right, we'll go to the next slide. All right, so where to start? Um, like I said, we started with those who were already doing the work. 
So the VA Medical Center is a great partner of ours. All of the SSVF providers are at the table and all of our grant per diems. If you can get those groups together um, and anyone else who's really touching homeless veterans and is engaged in solving homelessness for veterans, those are the folks to start with. If you can align your mission, your goals and values as a group, you're gonna have more success there. Um, so when we look for folks um, to join the group, we make sure that they're mission oriented in solving veteran homelessness and not continuing to react to veteran homelessness. And I think that that's one of the pitches I make um, is, you know, we're actually working to solve veteran homelessness. Do you want to join us in that in that work? Um, we've got meetings you can attend and we'd love to have your presence there. So what I do to bring more people to the table is I attend a lot of meetings and events where other folks are talking about veteran homelessness. And that includes our VCAP meetings, our COC meetings, suicide prevention meetings, community shelter meetings, outreach meetings. I attend those to try and get people who touch that outer area of veterans who are experiencing homelessness to join. I try and network with our healthcare providers, you know, our hospitals, our emergency rooms to see if that they have someone who can attend as well. Um, and I just ask for introductions. So when our county vet navigator joined, you know, one of my questions is like, who else do you know? Who can you bring to the table? Um, and the more people we bring, the more success we've had with that. Um, we'll go to the next slide. And that's really just my wrap up, my contact information. So hopefully this was helpful for everyone. Um, hopefully we have time for questions at the end as well. Um, but thank you, Jay. I'll turn it back over to you. All right, Kurt, you're up. Thank you, Deandra. Jay, are are you ready for BTC now? Yeah, absolutely. The floor is yours. Well, Deandra, thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to build a little bit on what you said by giving the view from the West Coast. So we are Veterans Transition Center of California. We operate on the old Fort Ord military establishment, which closed in 1994 and VTC formed two years later. And our mission there, empower veterans to move from crises to self-sufficiency. Next slide, please. This is where we're located on the Monterey Peninsula in Monterey County. We're about two hours south of San Francisco. We are the largest veteran serving nonprofit on California's central coast. And at any one time, half of California's 58 counties are represented in our veteran residents on site. Next slide. Little bit about us, we're an independent nonprofit where we answer to a board of directors. Our staff have specialized degrees that many of you are familiar with. Um, annual budget about seven million dollars. These are some awards we've won. The awards don't carry any direct benefit, but indirectly they are very, very good for writing grants or seeking partnerships because they lend credibility to that. They also have political cachet, which has really helped us, I think, broadening our partnership base. Next slide. Partnerships, I separated them into three areas. We have operational funds that come through health and human services. We have grants through HHS, through housing and urban development, and through the VA that fund some of our specific programs. And we'll talk to that in just a minute. Capital funds, I'll talk specifically about state grants, but counties and cities come through community development block grants primarily. And those have been a bit of a challenge. It's a source, but it's a source of frustration as well. And then finally, for projects, we have visibility at the state. We have partnered with developers and we have partnered with nonprofits. And we have one of those partners here and she will speak in just a minute. Next slide, please. And these are our programs and I'll turn it over to our expert. This is Michael Stull. He is a Navy veteran and he is the COO of VTC. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, any one vet that comes in will fall into one of six programs that we have. You see in these four different sections, three of them are funded by uh, federal and the last one is uh, funded by the state. Next slide, please. 
these are the, some of the numbers that we have. Uh, you can see the sponsor on the left, federal obviously is the VA and the two state um, uh, programs are indicated by, by the state, obviously. Those 106 beds are on Hay Circle, which will be on the next slide, but the, uh, the Veterans Hub is at CTF Soledad, which is, includes uh, 220 incarcerated veterans that we have at this time, with the capability of going up to uh, 1,200 veterans. And you can see the average length of stay on the far right-hand side. Next slide, please. About 250 meters away from our uh, administrative uh, building is what we call Hayes Street, which holds all our VTC housing. It's 16 old duplexes from the old Fort Ord uh, base, the old NCO houses. We've converted them to house either four or five people per side. And you can see by the various colors the, the, the spectrum of the programs uh, in, in, this, um, in this map. Of note here is that uh, the VA clinic is within a half mile of our location and that our pantry is also, again, 250 meters away um, from this uh, Hay Circle. So we're very close in proximity. Next slide, please. And the advantage is of putting our vets in a house and they live uh, much like tenants and we not only uh, provide the counseling that was mentioned before but a whole host of other programs and uh, benefits to really uh, give a holistic uh, support to them you can see all the programs and groups on the excuse me the groups on the right hand side and on the left hand side it, it just we fill wherever the gap is next slide please and this is Kurt Shockey again. So now we're going to go through two case studies just to talk about the partnerships. On the last slide showed Hayes Circle, which is again a street um, adjacent to our headquarters. And we have broken ground on a new 71 unit affordable housing project, which is dedicated and zoned only for veterans and their families. So this next slide. And this project is called Lightfighter Village. It's named after the tenant unit at Fort Ord, which was the 7th Infantry Division, which were known as the Lightfighters. We formed a partnership with EAH Housing that's up in the Bay Area of San Francisco. And the project is about $52 million. And the project had sat for a number of years until the California Housing and Community Development came in with some accelerator funds. The project was 52 million and the accelerator funds were 29 million of that. They came in to said, whatever you're doing, speed it up and spend the money faster to get these veterans homed. And as far as functional zero, Monterey and San Benito counties, the two counties that we serve, have 154 homeless veterans, according to the most recent point in time count. And VTC currently has capacity for 106 veterans. With this project, we will reach functional zero and we will be the second and third counties in the state of California to do that. Next slide. And Lightfighter Village, how did we partner to bring this project? It will expand our capacity for housed veterans by 70%. So we got the land, the land we have through the McKinney-Vinto Act, which was a 30-year quit claim deed. And we had to buy the property early. So we had to buy out the last seven years of the McKinney-Vinto Act through what's called abrogation through the federal government. We bought the land, the land is owned by VTC, and the project is co-developed by VTC with EAH, as I mentioned. They're also a nonprofit. The capital funds came specifically, Housing and Community Development, Veteran Housing for Homeless Prevention, gave us $15 million in addition to the accelerator funds that came through, and the remainder of the money, you can see where those came from. But the operational revenue is what VTC is most interested in. This is the, the day in, day out monthly cash flow that VTC has to support these veterans. And VTC is the, the sole service provider at the site. 
and the residents will be on hud vash veteran assistance for supportive housing so they'll be on vouchers which covers about half of the cost of a single room apartment in monterey county however Lightfighter Village is designed for low and extremely low income vets, so they will be covered through the vouchers here in this. We also have about a fifth of the units that are on project-based vouchers, and then we have service contracts through HUD and the VA to provide all residents integrative service with all of the VTC things that Mike had just mentioned. Next slide. So that was the first project. This is the second project. So this is known as, through the VA, as the Monterey Enhanced Use Lease. It's a federal program that I would encourage everyone to look into. This takes excess VA property in accordance with the PACT Act, and it allows you to use the property at no cost for 99 years, as long as you are mitigating veteran homeless through the property. So what VTC is looking to do in partnership with a number of other institutions is to take these six acres and as you're looking at the picture, we'd put housing on the, on the top of the screen and then the building, which is 35,000 square feet, we will spend the next century serving veterans as what we're calling a veteran center of excellence. Next slide. And a key portion of this are the partnership that we developed with the local nonprofit that has, has national implications. So I'll turn it over now to Christine Wingy, who is the Executive Director of Meals on Wheels of the Monterey Peninsula. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I wanna start by saying that we're very fortunate to have found the Veterans Transition Center to partner with as we expand our program, which is currently um, currently in Pacific Grove, about 20 minutes away from the VTC. So when I started at Meals on Wheels in 2000, right, actually before COVID hit, we were averaging about 48,000 meals served per year. Since then, uh, we have grown and we have, we have intentionally wanted to grow <laughs> to um, almost 600,000 meals per year. And uh, of those meals, little over 150,000 of them are specifically served to veterans. Um, we obviously see that there is a, a need for, for more growth in our area. Uh, we really want to focus on ending food insecurity in Monterey County. Uh, and with the partnership with the, the second kitchen that we're developing with VTC and this EUL project, we are, uh, we are really on our way to doing that. Um, we hope to have uh, the lease from the VA secured in the first part of next year and have shovels in the ground. We are all hoping by April to get this project underway. Um, we've also developed relationships with other counties and nearby that we will also serve meals to and their veterans as well. Um, and we will at the same time be able to serve meals to a lot of the programs that VTC already offers because they, they currently don't have a kitchen. So we're sort of satisfying a need on their side too. So it, we're working in tandem to make sure that, that both sides uh, get their needs met. Lastly, we are uh, another way we're partnering is through a jobs training program, which we will then with our new kitchen be able to uh, hire the veterans that are currently in the, the programs that VTC offers and provide them with kitchen certification credentials to be able to go out into the community. And we're, we're a hospitality driven community here in the Monterey Peninsula. Um, if any of you have heard of Pebble Beach, that's right where we are. Um, and so there's a, there are a lot of hospitality jobs in this area. And so we can fill a lot of those jobs with or through the Veterans Transition Center programming. Um, hospitality training, kitchen staff, uh, will also be able to train and employ drivers through this program. So it's a multifaceted partnership that I think both agencies are very excited about. Next slide. And again, VTC and Meals on Wheels are happy to answer any questions and we're happy to take 
any ideas you have or to help in any way with any of the agencies on today. So a link to our website is there, but you can also just look us up online. And again, we're happy to help with anything you need. We are active participants with the National Coalition of Homeless Vets. We look forward to this year's conference as well, and we're very grateful for the forum where we can share so all together we can better serve vets. Thank you. All right, thank you, Deandra and Kurt, for your excellent presentations uh, and also Kurt's colleagues. Uh, we're going to open it up for Q&A, so if you folks have any questions, remember to use that questions box. Um, I saw one earlier about the PowerPoints being sent to all the people on the webinar. The answer is yes. So as I said in the beginning, if some of you weren't there, uh, a recording of this webinar, as well as the slides, will be sent out in a separate email. You can also access the recording through our YouTube channel or our website, nchv.org, YouTube channels, the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. So uh, that's that. Uh, so first question, and by the way, if uh, our speakers can go on camera or not, um, that would be excellent for this Q&A portion. Uh, this question is for Deandra, Kurt, you're more than welcome to uh, also answer this question. So uh, about how community partners are engaged, uh, does everyone sign MOUs, letters of agreement, and can you speak to engagement levels with, network, with the network of partners, if any? Yeah, um, so we don't have MOUs, we do have the ROIs and we do have a standard community agreement um, in order to bring everyone together. And that's really set up through the COC since most of our work is a subcommittee of the COC. Um, so Jay, can you say the second part of the question again? Yes. Can you speak to engagement levels with network partners, if any? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I think we have really good engagement. So folks attend the meetings regularly and to the point where when they're not attending, they like let us know they'll be absent. So that's really wonderful. When community partners do happen to fall off or miss a number of meetings, um, either myself or one of the other co-chairs do reach out to ensure that they're still engaged in the work um, and that you know it's not a scheduling issue that we might have to consider. And so we do try and keep that warm connection. I think one of the things we also do is, you know, have have an icebreaker and have those candid moments where you can get to know each other, because I think when you have that human connection, you're more likely to continue to show up and engage as well. Right. And Kurt, do you want to take a stab at that? Sure. Um, I totally agree with what Deandra said. We're also active in the continuum of care. COC 506 is, is our COC locally, and I'm the board president there, so we're very active with the continuum of care and the coalition here. Um, our coalition has 28 members, and I think we're all in the business of serving homeless with a variety of services. As far as how we link up, there are a lot of informal partnerships, just word of mouth, handshakes, for kind of one-off things. If it's more dedicated, we really do work to get an MOU in place. We did that with Christine and with the Meals on Wheels. So we formalize the relationship specifically to delineate roles and missions. How do we help each other and what are our obligations? Usually those don't have a financial component to them. If it starts going into budgeting or co-budgeting, we really work to form a limited liability company. And that's what we've had to do with our developers of the sites that we're working on. So when it formalizes, we form an LLC so that we can wall off the project legally and financially from the parent organization so that you know we can contribute but we don't put at risk what we already have. Christine. All right. So next question, this is open to the both of you. So for smaller organizations, what are some valuable cross-industry partnerships that 
uh, organizations need to know and identify or form, or know, identify, and form. Well, at one time we were a smaller organization, so I would say connect with who your resource holders are. You know, for us, we have United Way, um, so make sure that you know who United Way knows and United Way knows you or whoever the United Way is of your area. Um, also the COC, get engaged there. And I think when you start engaging with the COC, you see who the other folks are at the table, um, you know, that you can connect with. And then, you know, who is also doing the work? I think don't be intimidated by being a small org because you have something to offer and getting connected to those big orgs, you know, you can connect with them and offer what you have and, and see what they can provide to you as well. But start start with your resource holders. Who has the information? This is Christine. This is Christine Mungi. Um, I wanted to add to that that simply going out and and meeting folks in the community, going to different events that are being offered by other local nonprofits, finding out what other people are offering and how you might be able to work together. That's been huge for us. And we have about 300 nonprofits locally here that uh, we probably work with uh, upwards of 50 of them, to be honest with you, depending on the program type. So we're always open to connection and, and engagement that way. Uh, and then certainly being able to um, uh, have events together. So, for example, next week the Veterans Transition Center folks are coming over to Meals on Wheels Community Center and we're going to have a big Thanksgiving together. So, partnering in that way too, where it's not just all business, but a little bit of fun too, is, is, always, is always helpful. Oh, I actually have a follow up question to that. Um, very important. Uh, what's the spread for that Thanksgiving? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So we're, we're working on that now. We have a few um, few surprises, but it will be traditional. So, you know, we want to make sure that the vets are being fed what they would normally want to eat. So things that they got at their dinner table when they were kids or, you know, young adults. And that, that's what we're looking to do. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, another open floor question. So what are some challenges early on in the formation of partnerships? What are some barriers? Um, well, I think I spoke to that a little, and it's in the scarcity mindset or the mindset of if I partner, am I going to not be able to meet my numbers? Or if I'm doing this and they're doing something similar, or will we be, have enough veterans to serve? And I think you you have to recognize that you're stronger together and it's worth the risk. Um, and moving past that mindset. Some of the other barriers, um, I think when it also comes to solving homelessness is there's just people who don't believe it's solvable. Like there are, there are people who just believe that this is a system that will always operate this way um, and that it's not going to change. And I don't know that we have to change their mind verbally. I think if that's the mindset they have, then we will just show them and hopefully eventually they'll come to the table. Hi, uh, barriers to partnerships. Uh, we, we get a, a full spectrum of people that have desire to assist our organization. Um, some over promise and under deliver, I guess. Uh, <laughs> some are, you know, just amazing and we're eternally grateful uh, for their assistance. Uh, some though, uh, um, yeah, over promise and under deliver and, um, it's not a, a wasted effort or anything, but it's a distraction of, from, from our real mission of feeding our vets every day. Um, kind of, a delay us a bit, if you will. Um, for getting a formalized relationship also is a barrier. Some, some people again have very high wishes, but they have great reluctance to put anything down on paper. Um, you know, sometimes these larger partnerships require paper and that might scare people away, but uh, you know, we have to protect the viability of the organization. Thank you. So Kurt, I wanna follow up on something that you mentioned uh, in your introduction slide when you went over some of the awards that uh, VTC has earned over the years, and you refer to them as a sort of political cachet in the formation of partnerships. So I'm interested in knowing 
or understanding how you can leverage the, how would I phrase this, the political will that serving veterans is a common sense issue. And Deandra, you're also welcome to answer this question as well. Thank you, Jay. I, I think, first of all, I, we're in an area, and I think many of us are in similar situations where they really support the military and they don't like homeless. We're at the intersection of that. So I think people choose to support us. We just need to find, as Deandra said, an area of common interest that overlap. And as far as the politicians, it, it's, it's good press, I think, for them to support veterans and to mitigate homeless. Um, so we really work on outreach. We have a department known as Strategic Initiatives that contacts political leaders. We offer tours. We offer any information they need on, on our operation or VA or NCHB data that could help them do their jobs. So visibility and, and overlap is kind of what we look for. And then they come back to us with, you guys are doing a great job. We'd love to put you in for this and really pay attention to the grants and applications. It seems like a distraction from the normal daily operations, but it, again, it does carry a lot of weight with donors, um, grant givers, and partners. I'm going to turn it over to Christine. She had something she wanted to add to. I was simply going to echo what, what Kurt said, honestly, um, and say, that it, it's not really a distraction from daily operations as much as it should be part of daily operations, honestly. Uh, I, I spend a fair amount of time meeting with different county supervisors, city officials. They know me by sight. I know them. At, it's, it matters. Those kinds of connections matter because then you get the first phone calls when there's extra money for a grant, um, even from United Way or from our found community foundations. Uh, it needs to be part of your weekly, if not, or monthly, if not weekly routine. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add, but, you know, outreach is part of everyone's role. And so I think just ensuring that the staff of the agency are well versed in what we're doing and why. Um, you never know who knows who and when you'll be in a room with someone. So, but Kurt and team covered it really well. All right, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, this is on conflict resolution or addressing disagreements. So uh, this is again for the both of you. So if you guys have a process for resolving any conflicts of interest or disagreements with partners, how do you king, or iron out those kinks? Yeah, I, um, I can think of a conflict that came up recently. I won't get too into it because it's not necessarily my story to tell. Um, but it's really just, you know, we have a, a semi formalized structure of leadership within our subcommittees where there are two co chairs. So typically, um, one or both of the co chairs works with the agencies or persons who are having the conflict offline um, to talk through what the issues are and really set some agreement. Um, if there is an opportunity to engage like funders, you know, if it's like a grant to grant issue, then we do try to do that as well. But in our groups, in our working groups, we've really come to a point where I think we can say without hesitation when we disagree on something and work through that. Um, and we also go with majority rules. So if one person really isn't bought in, but the rest of the group is, then that's how we'll move forward. Uh, looks like I've been tasked to jump on this grenade. Uh, so conflict resolution uh, with, with partners, we have a what's called the first veterans hub in the CTF Soledad, which is a, uh, which is a prison. There's 6,900 incarcerated veterans in the state of California. And the first hub in the nation is at CTF and we provide services to that hub. Right now it's 220 veterans which can go up to 1,200 veterans. And as you can imagine, the logistics and scheduling, uh, not obstacles, but uh, processes to, to get spaces is the most challenging because the CDCR staff, which is the uh, correctional officer staff, have obviously competing requirements that, or sometimes the requirements are in line and finding where, again, it's a win-win for both is, uh, 
is our main effort. Uh, we would love to own a space in there, you know, 24 seven, but that's just impossible. And so you, you just go through their bureaucratic process. And really what we want to do is uh, make their mission our mission so that they become our biggest supporter because we're helping them out so much. Um, and, and by proxy, we're doing our mission as well in the same way. So try to find that win-win. So another question here, uh, can strategic partnerships enable organizations to take on more clients that are more uh, complex or circumstances that are typically hard to navigate? Uh, open to the both of you. Sorry, are you looking for examples of strategic partnerships that help with that or just? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, one of the challenges for Detroit right now to hit functional zero and veteran homelessness is we, like many communities, have to solve for aging homeless veterans who are not yet ready for um, like a nursing home or advanced care, but really are just having challenges with ADLs living independently. Um, I don't have a solution yet, um, but that is one of the things we're looking at. You know, and first we approached our area agency on aging, and unfortunately they do not have capacity to support us right now. And we've looked at other programs within the VA, um, and there are some maybe glimmers of hope there. But then for non-VA eligible veterans, you know, that's going to leave them short. So we're constantly looking at who else we can bring to the table when we hit a roadblock. Um, but that that is one example of a challenging situation we're trying to solve right now. And we need a partner that we don't have. Um, this is Kurt. Uh, it, it is a challenge. We really look for people with specialized skills. We start with the VA, so they've got 24-hour care facilities, they have special counselors, they have um, substance use disorder, things like this that, that we lean on. We also go to local nonprofits as well. The county as well has county behavioral health, which has helped us from time to time. So we really look for other organizations that have particular specialties that we can leverage. Ideally, it will not come at a cost, but if it needs to be, we really look to have those offset by a dedicated donor or someone like this. We really look to make the VA priorities our priorities, as Mike said. So they needed emergency housing in Monterey County. We put 10 units up. They need to age in place. They need geriatric housing. We're applying for that contract. So we're really looking to serve whatever the emerging needs are of the VA. Did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, I do, actually, and this speaks in, uh, to Deandra's question or, or problem. If you talk to your your AAA and you tell them, you know, who are you provide, who's who are you giving money to that provides meals, and they're probably doing it, giving money to their local Meals on Wheels, right? That's all Title III money. That's all appropriate for you guys to to contact your AAA or I'm sorry, contact your local Meals on Wheels and be able to have the Meals on Wheels provide food to your aging population. Thank you. See, we're forming partnerships and solving problems here across <laughs> the country. <laughs> and, and as far as Meals on Wheels, typically they serve elderly and disabled, but the local Meals on Wheels has expanded their mission to add veterans. And, and that's been a real plus for both organizations. So we're really grateful for that. And the local chapters have the flexibility to do that. Thank you. Uh, we have time for at least a couple more here and then we'll wrap up. So another open floor question um, to detail a little bit about the history of uh, the VOAs and BTC's partnership. So what were some of the main challenges or challenges you have faced in forming partnerships and how were you able to solve it to continue the work? I mean, some of the main challenges are first buy-in, 
by like is when we're talking about solving veteran homelessness and hitting functional zero, it's really getting people to believe it's possible. Um, you know, when you think of Detroit, probably solving veteran homelessness is not what comes to mind, but you think of a really under-resourced um, poverty challenged city. So really it's shifting our own mindset and getting everyone on board. Um, and overcoming that is really just talking through that. Like, what are the challenges? Why don't we think we can do that? What is possible? What have we done? Who do we need? Like, what needs to be put in place before we start this work? Um, I think those are those are the really, like the starting points. Um, I'll turn it over to Kurt. Uh, yeah, I just wanna copy and paste Deandra's answer for, for us. Um, it's it's fun in the win-win, the, the Venn diagram, where the overlap is, where both the sides, both purposes are served. Uh, sometimes it, there is none there and you, you, you cannot find partnership uh, in other ways. Just like Anna says, it's, it's talking out and saying, all right, uh, how can we how can we solve this? Uh, most people are rational actors. Thank you. Thank you. And question here: When do you know when it's the right time to end a partnership? Or is there an end to a partnership? I mean. Uh... I don't know that we've ended many partnerships. I think partnerships have changed as like, you know, we're in a helping industry where staff turnover changes, leadership changes, so buy-in and mission changes. So I don't think any partnerships have necessarily ended, but I think the ways in which, or the amount in which organizations support one another, support a common mission shifts over time. Um, so thinking about some agencies here have really grown in other, non-veteran services, right? So like staff leadership time might be shifted to that, but I don't know that the partnership has ended because they might be doing a service like behavioral health that can impact, you know, our non-VHA eligible vets. So I guess that would be it. Uh, for VTC, it, it's, it involves a little bit of self-reflection. Uh, you need to do a, a, a reset point every once in a while and make sure you're not turning into something you're not. And if there is a partnership that uh, it's not serving the vets, it's not the core of your mission, then um, it becomes more and more aware, or you become more and more aware that perhaps it is time to, to break the partnership or at least to, to modify it. Great, all right, so that wraps up our questions for final webinar on roadmaps for strategic partnerships. I want to give the hugest thank yous to Deandra and Kurt for participating as well as the uh, colleagues that Kurt brought in to uh, present with him. Also, um, I want to make note that these uh, are definitely great starting points for your organizations uh, in the path to strategic partnerships. So uh, again, if you want to see the slides again or the recording, you can access them in an email that we'll be sending out later this week. And again, I wanna hammer in that you can watch these recordings on our YouTube channel at the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans and our website at nchv.org. Um, so again, Deandra and Kurt, uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, a couple other things that I want to make note of is that this is the last webinar, so there isn't another one next Wednesday. I'm so sorry. I know some of you were super excited and eager to be at the next one. Um, however, we do have the podcast, The Road Home, that's still coming out every Thursday until uh, November 22nd. So uh, be sure to tune in tomorrow. We have an excellent episode on Tenant Organizing featuring Mindy Woods and Brooke Schiffery. Uh, we'll talk a lot about uh, tenant advocacy, unions, and uh, what needs to be started uh, in that route to bring things like housing justice to uh, our communities or just you know simply organizing within our building. So uh, you can access the Road Home Podcast at Apple Podcasts or Spotify, whichever one you choose. Um, 
outside of that, uh, it was a pleasure having you both and especially our wonderful audience here to support us. And of course, huge shouts out to the Home Depot Foundation. Um, be sure to tune in on the recording and see ya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.